Hello everyone, welcome to our IEEE Big Data Analytics tutorial series. This is Chiu Shi from Arizona State University. I hope everyone is doing well. Today we are honored to have Dr. Dipioti Deca from Los Alamos National Lab to be our monthly speaker. He's going to talk about the provable estimation in distribution grids from a physical informed statistical learning perspective. In this tutorial, he will show us how he used the sensor data to solve problems such as topology identification, line impedance and load statistic estimation, phase identification, and others. This tutorial will be about 90 minutes long. In the end, Professor Wong and I will organize the Q&A. During this talk, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them to me or Professor Wang through the chat box. Okay, now I'm going to give the speaker to Professor Wang. He's going to give a brief introduction to, to Dr. Deca. Okay, thank you, Chosu. Yeah, so greeting from Arizona State, and I would like to thank Dr. Deca for the time. So yeah, I have known Dr. Deca for a while, and uh, he's very active in machine learning field, especially on topology detection, where I'm also yeah, working yeah, a little bit over. And uh, yeah, I have been following his work yeah, on topology detection, yeah, machine learning application to many other problems. So yeah, it's my honor to yeah, have Dr. Yeah, Deca from yeah, Los Amos National Lab today yeah, to give it a talk. And for your reference, he got a PhD from UT Austin, which is also very good at the yeah, power system analysis. So without further delay, yeah, Dr. Deca, please, yeah, I will enjoy your talk. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the invite. And uh, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah, we see the amazing picture. Oh, uh, is, it, is it now the first slide or which slide is it? Yeah, first one. Okay, all right. All right, thank you so much uh, for the invite and it's a great honor for me to discuss some of the work that we have been doing here in Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, I've seen some interesting talks in the past, including by some friends and colleagues. And uh, I would be talking specifically as mentioned about provable estimation and distribution grids. So by provable estimation, I mean estimation where you can give some guarantees and all of that, right? Now, just a big overview, since there might be people who might not know what Los Alamos is. So Los Alamos National Laboratory is one of the oldest DOE, which is in US is Department of Energy uh, Laboratory. It is, as I pointed out, in a state of New Mexico, it is more or less in the middle of US and uh, it is a big laboratory, so it is it is around 10,000 scientific stuff, which is equivalent to almost a large university. And uh, even though we are in the southern part of the US, we are at some elevation, we are at 7,200 feet, which if there are people in Europe, uh, we have ski hills nearby, which is like 10 minutes away from our lab. And it is near Santa Fe, New Mexico. So for people who might not know a lot about the geography of US, this is where Breaking Bad and all those shows have been shot around. And uh, informally, I'm a theoretical scientist. I belong to the theoretical division, uh, but I am a part of a group called the Advanced Network Science Initiative. So this is a strategic initiative of around 15, and now we are expanding it to around 20 people of uh, scientists, postdocs, and visiting collaborators who work on different aspects of, I would say, infrastructure science and network problems. This includes cybersecurity, gas grid problems, and we, uh, we bring a lot of, uh, I would say, mutually benefiting experience, both from theoretical physics, applied mathematics, computer science, and so forth. And our website is given here. This is LAN or LANC GitHub. 
Uh, and you can email me if you have additionally more questions about the kind of projects that we have and openings regarding postdoc staff or students. Right. Now coming back to the major topic of the talk here, which is uh, on the estimation problems in mostly in power distribution grids. Now what I have here is actually a map of the US transmission grid. This is slightly a map from a prior, uh, around a decade back. So when I talk about transmission grids, I actually mean large high voltage transmission lines, which are used in bulk transfer of electricity. Now, this map, as you can see, has multiple endpoints. Now, at majority of those endpoints is where the distribution grid starts, which is not, I would say, not depicted in this figure. So as some, most of you would be already aware, power grids for historical context uh, have been operated in a hierarchical fashion. So we have the high voltage transmission grids, and then we have the low voltage or medium voltage distribution grids. And this uh, differentiation is primarily with respect to the operating voltage. So high voltage has greater voltage, medium and low voltage has lower voltage. The distribution grid is the part of the network going from distribution substation to the end users, which is homes, businesses, and all that. And they have traditionally been operating as a load at low voltages. So primarily when you look at, and by primarily, I mean 15, 20 years back, the traditional direction of flow in the power grid has been from the large transmission operators, the generators to the end user. So there's this one direction unit of flow from the transmission grid to the distribution grid. However, in the recent years across the world, in fact, I could say much more in places such as Europe, you have had a lot of influx of active devices, local generation and renewables on the distribution side as well. So this include, let's say your Tesla, you have smart air conditioners or even solar panels and so forth. As a result of this, what has ended up happening is there is this bi-directional flow of electricity, both from transmission to distribution and vice versa. But this is good. In a lot of contexts, this is supposed to make the grid greener. We are going into more of cleaner energy sources. But this also leads to a lot of issues because the grid, and this is a very infrastructure heavy network, was originally not devised or designed in terms of this bi-directional flow of electricity. So you have a lot of issues now. So including some of these issues would imply uh, greater variability or intermittency. So it is less of a grid where you can as all of you know, it, it is hard to plan for the future when you have this much amount of uncertainty in the system because you might have planned that you are going to get that much amount of wind, but the wind doesn't show up. On top of it, and if some of you are on Power Globe, you might have noticed a very insightful discussion happening in the last few weeks on the stability of the grid and what it means when there is less rotating mass or inertia in the grid. So there is greater, larger fluctuations in the grid, and what are the effective ways of controlling it? Do we have things that sort of reflect how traditional things used to work or do we need to rethink everything about how control in the new era would operate? However, it is fairly accepted to have greater control or to have a new paradigm of optimizing the grid with more renewables and more fluctuations, you would need greater observability greater observability and from observations, you can then do predictions and so on and so forth. Okay. So when I talk of uh, use, I basically mean use cases. So the kind of things that we need to think about properly again in this new grid context with more renewables and more uncertainty is estimation. So estimation, by estimation, I mean you need to figure out what the current state of the grid is. This includes what the physical aspect of the grid, which is uh, to do with who is connected to what, if things have failed or not. For example, in, uh, in the American grid context, at least a lot of small faults or failures that happened actually result from animals, including squirrels eating into a wire and all that. So you need to know if that is really a small failure or is it like a cyber attack by a adversary? No. Quite closely related to estimation, uh, to est estimation is a problem of optimization and resilience. So optimization, as we know, Generally, power grids operate in a market fashion. You have a network constant optimization problem. So knowledge of the current state of the grid as well as the connections in the grid are necessary because these are parameters which go into the optimization problem that you're solving. And there's this entire area of uh, 
uh, cyber attacks based on estimation, which can then result in errors and monetary losses in the optimization or, or operation of energy market. Similarly, as some of you, at least who are here in US would have heard in the last year or so, there is an entire big issue regarding forest fires or even grid related uh, false and ensuing forest fires in the Californian context. And then you would need to have better observations and better predictions to be able to do some of control or uh, mitigate some of the issues related to grid resilience. And these are normally controllable, but when things go wrong, it can go really wrong. You can end up with blackouts, which has happened multiple times. These are no frequency events, but if and when they happen, it leads to losses of billions of dollars. And you do not want to ever be in a scenario like that. So a major focus of researchers in estimation or optimization is to prevent such blackouts and design techniques how to do it. Now, I did talk about the fact that you need better real terms of reality, but is that even possible? Now, what has happened at least in the last 20 years is there has been a steady increase in the way the grid has been monitored. There are more and more devices, including high fidelity measurement devices such as phase measurement units or the large transmission grids. The map which I showed was from NASPI. This is a few years back again, and this is it already says so now we'd have around 3000 network PMUs in the system in the large US transmission grid, and this has led to in some ways, a lot of revolution in terms of the kind of detection schemes that have been designed. So now we are fairly good at monitoring for oscillations and identifying stability issues in the large transmission grid in certain pockets, for example, in New England and so on. Similarly, on the distribution side, you have had new measurement devices come in. There has been a lot of micro PMUs being deployed, including uh, uh, through DOE projects at, in California and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Similarly, a lot of smart devices, just because of the fact that they are able to control some devices or monitor their state and they're connected to the internet, you can collect measurements from, let's say, smart thermostats, link it to your uh, app and know what the current status or have a very, uh, very good observation window into what the current state of neighborhoods on the distribution grid. The issue though is that these measurement devices are not everywhere. However, it, and this, this low observation is actually more uh, critical in areas such as low voltage distribution grids where traditionally we didn't do a lot of monitoring. Again, primarily because it used to be a passive source. It was just a load which we used to consume power. So if things go wrong, we would just disconnect it. But now given the fact that you have things in the distribution side that you can control, you can have bi-directional for breakfast, it is necessary to have more monitoring, but again, because of uh, play, placement of the and the, of the infrastructure, the, of the metering infrastructure that has to be put in, it is still sparse. But having said that, it is not sparse enough to say that there are almost zero measurements. We still have measurements, it is just not ubiquitous, so it is not everywhere. Now, when you talk of machine learning, particularly in a power grid concept, and it is worth mentioning the power grid, at least in the US context, or actually in any, any context, is considered to be a critical infrastructure which is important for the overall socioeconomic uh, well-being of the entire country. When you have such a large amount of data collection going on, you can do what would be fashionably called machine learning or uh, data analytics based on it. Now, if you think about it, you can think of data analytics in broadly two ways. One is what I would call as the physics-informed tuning, and uh, by which I mean this is more or less traditional methods of looking at data. So what you would do there is you would have very detailed models and simulation tools for looking at power systems, and then you can use that, look at the data together with it and see, or sort of represent how things are, identify where there are changes from normal behavior and figure out where things go wrong or which part of the grid is operating correctly. The primary caveat with this kind of very highly interpretable physics informed methods is that it would require a lot of repetitive uh, analysis, and it is often offline, all right? So for example, this includes, let's say, reduced order models of uh, subparts of a system used in control rooms, and a lot of that is not actually online updated. You have to have an offline uh, verification, and once you have verified it, you bring it back onto the system. On the other hand, and this is not necessarily from the power grid context, but in general, uh, data analytics area, which is pretty hot right now, is what you have 
physics free machine learning and by physics free i mean more of a black box based approach for machine learning and this implies basically tools and techniques where you look at the data you see that the data has certain features that you observe and then you use those observations do some training and then make uh, interesting predictions of what the future is and then you verify if those algorithms work or not now these are often at very high speed there are also very nice architectures now to do this kind of six free machine learning the issue here one as i pointed out is that it has low interpretability so you know you have broad ideas of how things work but if things go wrong you at best have some intuition of it but given again given that given that power grid is a critical infrastructure what we would be interested in and what a lot of people including uh, young and others have been working on is what would be and this has become a buzzword now would be called as a physics informed machine learning by which i mean you want to have the best of both worlds. So you want to have the speed that you get from new machine learning algorithms or statistical analysis, but you want to impose more and more information from the system or domain expertise that you have so that you can give some interpretations of the results that you have. Right? And there are different advantages of it. Among others, you can sort of say when things go wrong, when uh, some of the assumptions that you initially assumed about the data do not hold, you can still give some results on uh, how the algorithms will perform. Now, when I talk of uh, distribution grids in particular, so let's shift the focus on what we are interested in, in learning distribution grids, uh, at least in the American context and actually globally, majority of distribution grids are radial in structure. By radial in structure, I mean there are organized as trees. So you have one substation fitting a subset of nodes and they're arranged in a tree structure. Now this tree structure can be changed because there is a lot of redundancy in the system, but during operations, the operating lines, so not the lines which are connect, which are which are disconnected, but the connected lines from which power is being flown, has this nice radial structure. And then the kind of problems that you'd be interested in distribution grids, primarily because you don't have real time metering on lines everywhere, you are interested in knowing the structure of the grid. So you want to know who's connected to what, and this can be not just uh, topological connections, that is connections of neighborhood, but also phase-based relationships. So if you have a three-phase distribution grid, you might be interested in knowing who's on what phase. Secondly, uh, you another problem that you'd be interested in is in learning line impedances or learning parameters of impedances or of uh, statistics of different neural injections. So which load, what, what is the fluctuation of different loads of so and so forth. Okay, and this parameter learning is necessary or statistical analysis is necessary because these are then used in follow up optimization and control uh, problems. The sad thing is a lot of those parameters are not calibrated in real time or even near real time. So, and this was followed up by discussions with let's say distribution with operators who would say that a lot of those parameters that we use in our let's say, optimization tools, they have not been calibrated in the last, I would say 10 years or so. Because again, it is very, when you do manual calibration, it is very cost, uh, cost heavy and requires a lot of time as well. And you want to do it in near real time using some uh, machine learning algorithms. And again, from a very practical perspective, all of this makes sense when you have incomplete observations in the grid. That is, you don't have measurements everywhere, but you want to impose certain conditions and design algorithms that you can do solve this learning problems effectively. And as I mentioned, I was talking about provably correct and theoretically robust algorithms. But theoretical guarantees, and this is coming from a very statistical context, is you'd not just give an algorithm which works when you have a lot of data, but you'd also want to answer questions such as, hey, I want to learn the structure of the grid, but what is the length of observations that I should at minimum have after which I can guarantee that this learning algorithm is going to be close enough to a true solution? Similarly, a lot of these measurements might be corrupted with noise, and we might want to answer questions about how much noise is okay for the algorithm to work with. That is, how much up till how much noise can I say this algorithm is going to work correctly? Similarly, you can say, hey, I have incomplete observations in the grid, but how much observations do I, or how many meters do I need in the system, and how should I place them so that the learning algorithm is able, able to give me a theoretically verified correct answer? So these are the kind of theoretical guarantees that you talk about in this estimation context. What I'll not talk in this talk is about data-driven control laws or data-driven optimization problems. Okay, so for example, just like you have a lot of measurements been collected, you can also use them in designing control problems, for example, voltage control. 
And in bulk power grades, you can also talk about designing uh, feedback loops or even getting generator set points using data-driven uh, optimization or machine learning. And I think at least two talks in this seminar series recently, including by my friend Linne and Vesalis, have been on part of the talks have been on this data-driven control optimization. But I will not talk about it, but if anybody has questions, given we have done some prior work in it, I can talk about how estimations relate to it. And uh, there's also some work done uh, on showing that you can take information from this data-driven optimization itself and then do some parameter estimation based on it. So this is a brief overview of the rest of our talk, which is going to become more, I would say, mathematical. So I'll talk of three different things. One is I'll talk about generally learning and distribution grids, which would be topology, the structure, or parameters. And I'll talk different flavors of it with different amount of uh, unobserved, unobservedness or information in the system. Then I'll take a leap forward and say, hey, what if distribution grids, which I assume to be radial, are not radial, then how do I look at those kind of systems? And I'll talk about one specific way, which is using graphical models or probabilistic random variables of looking at estimation problems. And then I will go from general steady state operations to dynamic operations and talk about how some of these learning algorithms can be taken from a uh, static perspective of the grid to a dynamic perspective and still give some optimization results. And at the brief one or two slides, I'll talk about where this all fits in, in the new concept, where you have a lot more information and with uh, novel uh, machine learning architecture such as neural networks and so forth. Now, I did mention your title that I'm talking about physics informed. So when I talk of physics informed, I talk, what I really mean is you have domain expertise which can lead to restrictions in your search space. So if you're solving any inference or learning problem, you have to find the optimal solution. Now, a lot of feasible solutions might be there which agree with your data, but you want to have, you want to find a true optimal solution by restricting the search space. So this, this restriction can be topological. For example, you can talk about the structure of the grid. In, the, in distribution grids, it, it means, hey, the distribution grids is primarily radial, so the measurements that I have should also agree with the fact that the grid is radial. Or even if the grid has certain loops or is meshed, these loops are generally large. So they are not of size three or four, but have large loops. And we should, you can use that as a constraint in your learning algorithm. Similarly, you can talk about restrictions because of flow physics. And by flow physics, I mean conservation laws or power flow equations that we normally study in, which can be both in the static and dynamic regime. And by static regime, I mean the general power flow equation. You have injections, P and Q at a particular node, which is leading to flows on the lines connected to the particular node or bus. And this line flow is given by uh, Ohm's law, which in complex dynamics include a complex uh, Equation represents both nodal voltages V, which is voltage magnitude VA and phase angle theta, as well as the impedances R and X of lines. Now, this is a nonlinear equation. What you'd often do in a lot of this learning this algorithm is when you look at ambient regime, when fluctuations are small and they're operating around the standard operating point, you can take a first order expansion, which is known as Lindis flow or actually Lindis flow is slightly different. This is more even a relaxation of Lindis flow, where you look at a linear relationship between the voltage phase angles theta and the voltage magnitude V with the active and reactive injections P and Q. Okay. Now this matrix H is actually the weighted Laplacian matrix. So this is a weighted Laplacian matrix which relates the structure or the topology of the grid and the weights, impedances of lines, in the representation between injections and voltages. Okay. But this is Lindis flow and is also related to the DC power flow that you'd normally have. Right. So that was the static regime. You take one sample of injection, you get one sample of voltage, phase angle and magnitude. Now, if you take just the relationship between phase angle and active power and you ignore Q, V, X and uh, up R, what you'd get is the DC power flow. And this is more or less a power balance equation. All it is saying is whatever injection is coming on the line or on a node is resulting in flows on all lines connected to the node A. So there is power balance at each node. Now from static, you can then go to a dynamic regime, which for ambient fluctuations, quite often what you'd use is known as the swing equations. So what this equation really says is you do not have balance everywhere. 
Okay, so PA plus this quantity is not equal to zero. Excuse me. But this imbalance at every node is leading to a dynamics of state variable, which here is uh, voltage phase angle and is derivatives. So in particular, this dynamic swing equation would represent uh, uh, the temporal dynamics related to nodal frequency or change of frequency at each node. Okay. And this is a standard swing equation. These are constants which represent the inertia and damping of the different nodes. So these are the physics in form. So one is the structure, the other is the flow physics, so which static regime where I take just a power flow, you would normally use it if samples are coming at every greater than one minute, dynamic regime if it is less than one second. So. And the next part of the uh, objective of my analysis is statistical learning. So I use this physics informed information and then use statistical learning. Now what statistical learning does is you use collections of large amounts of data, which is still finite, and look at their properties. So one of the ways of looking at it is you measure sufficient statistics of those quantities. So for example, you can look at means and covariances of uh, uh, quantities that you measure at different locations in the grid. So for example, you can look at wind speed, you can look at uh, the amount of irradiation or the amount of solar power available across a different geography. From a theoretical con context, however, what is also important is this kind of statistical information can also result in concentration bounds. So what concentration bounds do, which you uh, learn, which comes from actually high dimension statistics is when you look at this kind of sufficient statistics, such as means and covariance and other measures, sub concentration bounds more or less tell you how good are those values that you're computing, how are they, how empirical are these empirical estimates, how good of an estimate they are, that is how far are they from true values. So for example, in this image, which is taken from Yuri Dawkins' paper on uh, defining wind power sets, you can see that the wind power more or less looks, looks like a Gaussian, but given that you have finite number of samples, there is still some discrepancy in it. So there's a distinction between the distance between the true distribution and the uh, empirical distribution that you get. What conservation bound will tell you is how many such samples do you need so that the empirical distribution is close enough in a very probabilistic sense to the true distribution. And these are this is a, one particular bound which you use, which is known as Huygens bound. There are other bounds such as Chernobyl bound and so forth. And this kind of conservation results are also used in signal processing in wireless communication, information theory, and so forth, to kind of guarantee how good your performance is with compared to uh, the asymptotic limit where you have measurements, where you have infinite amount of data. Now, combining both this physics informed and statistical learning, what I would do is get to provable learning solutions. That is, I'll design algorithms which I know are correct at infinite number of samples, but I can also tell you when I have finite sample of data or noisy data, with high probability, how correct are they? So can I just bound the amount of error that I can get solution? Okay. Now moving on, let's move on to the kind of problems that I'm interested in. So the first problem I talked about, and this is fairly straightforward is, uh, let's say you have voltage data in a distribution grid, by which I mean you have voltage magnitude time series data. Can you use that to estimate connections in the grid, by which I mean, can you find out uh, who's connected to what, what is the neighborhood structure in the distribution grid that might change from time. So you have no information about any connections or lines in the distribution grid, but you want to estimate the operation topology. All right, now if you have voltage data across a time window, you can actually compute the mean, mu, as well as the second order statistics or the covariance of voltage data. Now using the powerful equations that I recently just showed in the static regime, in a radial distribution grid, you can actually compute this quantity, which is the variance of voltage differences. So you just take the voltage at two different nodes, take the mean out and find, look at the second order characteristic of it. And you can show that this variance of voltage differences actually increases along in a real radial distribution grid will increase along every permissible path. So for example, if you take node A, B and C, which are always organized such that the path from A to C, in all these three cases, the path from A to C goes to B, then the variance of voltage differences between A and C is always going to be more than the variance of voltage difference between A and B, right? So now, if I know that that always holds true in the true grid along the real existing paths in the system, to do a topology learning, all that I need to do is, 
for every possible edge pair, that is every possible node pair, A and B, which may or may not have an edge, I give it this weight, phi AB, which is equal to this variance of voltage differences. And then I just construct a spanning tree with this variance of voltage differences as the edge well. And because I know it always increases along uh, true graph edges, the spanning tree is going to be the true operational grid with the true lines in the system. Okay. So this is a very easy algorithm, but again, it is based on the power flow equations and is coming from the fact that the system is 3D. Now note that this only uses voltage data, but it requires data at all nodes. And what we also saw, showed in some follow-up work that this kind of greedy topology learning is not necessarily limited to power grids alone. It is true for any monotonic flow system. By monotonic flow system, I mean a flow system where if you increase the potential difference between two nodes, the flow on the line kinetic increases. So for example, a lot of systems such as water systems or thermodynamic system or even gas networks, where just the definition of your potential will change from voltage to let's say nodal pressure and all that. If you increase the potential difference, the flow would increase, you, such a greedy learning algorithm works. And there's fairly good computation complexity, which basically comes from the Kuskal's algorithm to, to uh, the graph reconstruction based on the spanning tree. What's more, as I mentioned, because you have concentration results from high dimensional statistics, what you can do is if you make an assumption or you know that the volt or the, the injection profiles or load profiles at different nodes is sub Gaussian. So it is basically a distribution which has uh, exponential tails. You can measure the amount of information, you can, you can measure the observation window or the number of samples necessary to give a consistent answer. So for example, if I want to ensure that the probability of success of my learning algorithm is at least one minus epsilon, where epsilon is small, the number of samples of voltage that I require scales as order of V, when the V is the number of nodes, V square log V by N. Again, this, so this makes it slightly more rigorous than just saying I have a learning algorithm which works when there's a lot of data. I have a learning algorithm now where I can say what is the observation window that I need to consider to give uh, statistically correct answer. And this is one particular uh, simulation on a tertiary bus system. Note that when we do the analysis, it's based on uh, linearized power flow, but when we run simulations, we actually consider nonlinear power flow. And, but it is not surprising the results would extend easily because uh, the deviations between linear and nonlinear power flow, when the injection deviations are small, the voltage deviations are also fairly small. So they, the power flow results would match and hence the learning algorithms also work. And if needed, one can make it more rigorous. One can look at the maximum error, which is possible between voltages, between linear and nonlinear power flow, and then use it to give a sample guarantee on the number of observations that you require so that your learning algorithm works with uh, nonlinear power flow samples. And as expected, you can see when the noise covariance increases, the performance goes down. But then again, even this can be theoretically analyzed as you have done in papers, where you say, what is the maximum amount of noise that the system can tolerate? which depends on different parameters of the system, such as the impedance values and the nodal injection statistics. Okay. Moving on, I did talk about the fact that uh, the learning algorithm which I presented using spanning tree requires voltage magnitude measurements at all nodes in the system. Now that can be slightly harder to get. Now what if there are unobserved nodes in the system? So if I have unobserved nodes, which are written as dotted circles, and I still want to compute the spanning tree using this variance of voltage magnitudes. Again, using the same power flow equations, you can show that the spanning tree that you get may be very different from the two underlying system. For example, one possible configurations, and there are finitely many such configurations that you can get. You can have a configuration where two nodes, which are four hops away, for example, C1 and C4, they were four hops away in the true graph. In the spanning tree of the observed system that you get, they can become siblings, that is, they're connected to the same parent. Okay. So clearly, the spanning tree algorithm by itself doesn't work. Okay. What is necessary is you need to still find out where the location of the hidden nodes in the system is. So in this case, what we actually figured out is that instead of looking at just the, just the variance of voltage magnitude differences, phi AB, we look at this variance of voltage magnitude differences, but at three 
nodes in the system. So I call it a node triplet. So for example, if there is a parent A in the constructed uh, spanning tree, you look at phi A with phi two siblings C5 and C6. So for example, you take phi AC, phi A6, and then you deduct phi C5 and C6. So when you do this, for every single pair of children for this node A, you can construct a matrix for this node triplets. And then what we see theoretically is under the power flow equations in a radial grid, when you compute this quantity and plot it as a matrix, this matrix has this nice clustering feature. So what ends up happening is uh, for nodes or for children, which have a common parent. So for example, CP are the children of P, CB1 is the children of B1 and CB2 are the children of P2. When you compute this quantity for nodes which have a common parent, this quantity is positive. On the other hand, for nodes whose parents are siblings, so for example, CP1 and CP2, or CP2 and, uh, or this should have been CP1, sorry for a typo, the value is zero. On the other hand, the, or the, the value of this, this quantity for nodes which are further away, so between CP and CP1 or CP2, the value is negative. And this again comes from the way impedances and power flow equations on a tree uh, operate. And the advantage of this is that if you can construct this matrix for all the observed nodes in the system, that is for A, C1, C2, and all that, you can just construct this matrix and then cluster it and identify what are the nodes which have a common parent. Okay. So you can find out that C3, C4 have a common parent, C5, C6 have a common parent, P is a common parent of C1, C2, and it's not a sibling of B, so it has to be somewhere up there. So you can construct this iteratively and figure out the hidden nodes in the system and insert them. So we have now a tractable learning algorithm for the case even when there is missing nodes in the system, but provided the missing nodes are not adjacent, so what you do in this learning algorithm is you first construct the spanning tree, and then you find this matrix CA1, CAJ, and CIJ, cluster it, find out the location of missing parents, insert them, and then keep on iterating all the way from the leaves of the tree, which are terminal nodes, all the way to the substation or the root of the system. And then you can show that you cannot just learn a system with missing nodes, but also identify where the parents are and insert them and so forth. And this is there in this paper. So there are further more simulations and more theoretical results on what the complexity of the system is and when does this break down, why we require uh, this intermediate or uh, hidden nodes to not be adjacent to each other, but I would uh, not go into those details. But we have studied that and realized that uh, when such missing nodes are actually adjacent to each other, then you would not learn the exact topology, but you'd learn some cron reduced version of the structure, which is still good enough for optimization. Now moving on, that was learning using nodal voltages, but either nodal voltages which are everywhere or when the missing nodes are uh, not adjacent to each other. In a more realistic context, however, and this was again coming from a discussion with a uh, distribution grid operator in the Metna conference, a more interesting problem is when you have missing nodes and you do not have observability in the system entirely, but you have nodal voltage data as well as load data or injection data limited to end users in the grid. So for example, consider the system where you have households at the end. You do not have information anywhere in the middle, which is sort of shaded, but you have information regarding both voltages as well as injections at the terminal nodes in the system. And more importantly, not only do you want to understand or estimate the topology or the structure of the system, you also want to estimate the impedances of lines. So you want to understand also the parameters of the connections uh, that are operational in the system currently. <laughs> okay. So as before, you have voltage data, so you can compute first and second or statistics of voltages. You also have timestamp active and reactive injection data at the terminal nodes in the system, so you can compute sigma and mu for the injections. But more importantly, since you have both voltage and injection data, you can also compute cross covariances. So you can look at how the voltage at one particular node change it with respect to the injections at some other node, either near or far, So, you, but among the observed nodes in the system. So can you use this data then to learn the structure of the system, assuming that the system is radial, which is true for the majority of the distribution. So here we will design the algorithm, and again, I'll say how it becomes physics or power flow informed, and then it results into a statistical machine learning algorithm. 
Now, let's say I could compute the effective impedance between observed nodes in the system. Okay? Now, what effective impedance is, is a formula which is given according to the inverse Laplacian, weighted Laplacian of the distribution grid. But in reality, what it means is, effective impedance implies if I took one unit of power at node A and removed it at node B, and looked at the ensuring change in the potential or voltage in the system, how does they relate? So effective impedance in indirectly means if the entire rest of the system is effectively made into one impedance connecting node A and B, how does the voltage change across A and B relate to injection chains between A and B? Okay. What is known though under topological restriction and fairly well known in power systems is that effective impedances are actually additive on trees. So if you have a radial system, the effective impedance between node A and B is actually the sum of impedances on the unique part which connects node A and B. So it makes it additive. So let's say I could estimate this effective impedance or effective resistance between every terminal bus or node in a distribution grid. So now what I have is an additive thing, which whose value I know between all observed nodes. And I want to use this observed effective impedances to learn this tree as well as find its distances between all possible nodes in the system, some of which are not even observed. Well, it turns out, outside of power grid, this, there is already a known algorithm called recursive grouping algorithm by Animan and Kumar and Alan Wilski and all that, which came a few years back, where they look at just general tree topologies, not necessarily with respect to power grid, under this kind of additive distances, and look at how do you learn this tree as well as estimate the distances between them. And it actually results, which again flows very clearly in power systems context, from certain restrictions which happen in trees. So if you have a distance D, there are constraints that only nodes which have a common parent, that is their siblings, satisfy. So usually if you could measure this distance D between all possible uh, terminal nodes or leaps in the system, you can identify which among them are siblings or have a common parent based on checking for a linear constraint. So you can learn the siblings. At the second level, there is also additional constraints which can help you identify what the distance between a node and its parent, which in our case is not even observed, can be measured. So for example, if D is the effective impedance, then you can measure the distance between B, A and B, which is the value of the impedance on this line between a terminal leaf and its parent, using the value of impedance distances between all the observed nodes in the system. So this leads to a very recursive or iterative algorithm. In the first step, you learn the siblings based on the first constraint. And the second step, you insert the parent and estimate the impedances to the parent. Then the next iteration, you look at the all the nodes which do not have a known parent, this includes the newly discovered nodes, as well as any nodes which doesn't have a previous sibling. And then you again club them based on siblings with a common parent, you insert a node, learn the distances to it, and then just keep on iterating it till you land up with the final distribution grid where you have estimated all possible edges and the impedance values. Okay. Now, where does power flow come in? So, or power flow physics come in is how do you estimate this effective impedance? So this effective impedance, as I said, is related to values in the, uh, the inverse suppression matrix of nodal resistances. Now it turns out, given you have measurements of nodal voltages and injections at a terminal leaves, you can use the power flow equations and compute, solve a linear regression problem rather, which relates the measured quantities of cross correlation between voltages and injections, as well as the covariances between different nodal injections and compute these entries in this matrix and then try to estimate what the effective impedance is. Now, if I assume that the injections at different nodes was uncorrelated, that is the fluctuations are independent, this matrix can be identified by solving a set of different uh, two cross two uh, linear matrix equations. Okay? So this makes it fairly simple. On the other hand, we all know that quite often the nodal injections might have a little bit of correlations between them. So it, this is a figure of nodal um, covariances from a data set from Alborg. You can see that even though it is primarily diagonal, there are a few entries here and there which shows that there is some correlations. 
So in that setting, this matrix of nodal correlations between different loads is not going to be diagonal. It will have some covariance structures. And let's assume this thick lines here represents, uh, represents the inverse covariance structure between the nodal injections. Then you can again use a machine learning algorithm, such as one that is known as SPICE, by which you can estimate this inverse covariance quantity, and then resultingly estimate the values in the, in the inverse Laplacian, and then compute that at impedance. And again, going to a statistical, uh, high-dimensional statistical context, where you can have consideration results, for the power flow operations that you have, and assuming that uh, injections are the variables, and then voltages are derived from injections, and assuming injections are sub Gaussian, you can look, you can show that if you have order v log v, where mod v is the number of nodes in the system, you can guarantee that the effective impedances are going to be close enough to the true values, which means our learning algorithm is going to recover the true topology and impedance by uh, accuracy. On the other hand, for correlated natures, you see that you require more samples, which is again. Uh, more intuitive, right? So if you have more correlations in the data, you require a larger amount of uh, observation to estimate uh, those quantities. Okay, and this is the, the derivation, which is slightly more involved. It takes, because it, you have to solve multiple concentration results between uh, combinations of random variables, uh, is there in this paper. So for interested people, I would encourage you to go through that. And uh, it includes some very nice mechanisms of how you look at uh, quantities such as that. Okay. Such as secondary statistics and cross covariances of voltages and injections. Right. And this is some basic simulations on IEEE 33 bus graphs. Uh, this is with map power generated samples. Uh, you can see around 700, 800 samples with, is going to guarantee that they have a good enough uh, success ratio of more than even 80%. Note that in all of the simulation results, we actually not assume we have any prior information on the grid, other than the fact that it's radial. Now, if you knew that. Uh, Certain nodes, for example, because this is a physical grid, you know that this bus and this bus can never have an edge together because they are so far away. You can use this kind of restrictions in the learning algorithm itself so that when you search for impedances and neighbors, you reduce your search space and this can lead to better uh, computational performance or sample based performance in realistic systems. This is more of a theoretical way in which we assume no additional information and run these simulations. So that was about radial grids. So I did talk about the fact that you can learn topology in certain settings. If you have some injection measurements at certain nodes, you can do not just topology, but you can do line impedance estimation as well when there is missing data. But note that a lot of those algorithms actually relied on the fact that you have a radial structure. So hence certain order statistics come in. You can know who's greater than what and how things become additive or non-additive and so forth. However, I did assume a static power flow samples. So these are the code. There is no correlations between injections between different times, and the system was radial. But what happens when you go from a radial system to a loopy system or a mesh system? Well, that brings me to the second part of the talk, which is going to be on graphical models. So I want to go beyond radial grids. I want to look at mesh systems. Maybe these mesh systems are not very small, they have large cycles such as in transmission grids or even this uh, new distribution grids which are being proposed for the context of reliability. But can I do some kind of estimations such as for topology and so forth for such non loopy systems? And for that, I will use what is known as graphical models. Now, what exactly is a graphical model? A graphical model is nothing but a more of a graph-based representation of the probability distribution. So when we normally look at random variables, we uh, I think intuitively think mostly along the lines of correlations. So for example, if you have temperature data, you also have load data and you have price data of your electricity bill. If you think about it, it is very intuitive to think that they are going to be correlated. You have a sunny day, the temperature is higher, your air conditioning is also operating a lot. And subsequently, the price on your electricity bill is going to be higher. But if you think about it, what we should really be thinking about in terms of should be conditional dependence. By which I mean, your temperature and price of your bill might be correlated, but this dependence between them is actually happening through the load, which means if I give you the information about the amount of load being consumed, the pricing data is independent of temperature. That is, temperature does not have any additional information about your price other than which is already encoded in the load of the system. So this is a very uh, dependence or information flow-based way of looking at uh, probability distributions. And that is what a graphical model is. Now, 
this is often taught in as a part of I'd say signal processing or a statistical machine learning course. But to very briefly say what it means, you should think of inverse correlation, okay? inverse correlation or conditional dependence instead of correlation. So, for example, this is a figure of what happens to correlations of stock prices. As would be very well known, the stock prices are always correlated generally. For example, now with COVID and all that, you can see that that is true as well. But if you want to look at the dependency structure, you should be all about who influences what, because a lot of these dependencies may not be direct. It should be, it can be indirect as well. You should look at inverse correlation or a graphical model of such stock prices. Again. Now, in a public context, I can look at a probability distribution on neural pages. And how do I do it? Now let's assume okay, that the injection fluctuations are independent, and this has also been fairly well verified in practice. So if you look at if you mm, look at load data and sort of uh, detrend them the right way, you can see that these fluctuations, at least in distribution side, can be independent. Now, if they're independent, this is how the distribution of injections and p here means both p and q would look like, and this is with respect to the distribution of fluctuations. Now, as I mentioned, there is this static power flow relations, which represent a relationship between voltage theta and the magnitude, phase, magnitude of the voltage with active and reactive injections. And this represents a map between the statistics of voltages and the statistics of injections. And using this linear relation, you can actually represent the distribution of voltages, right? And this is nothing but just a change of uh, variables from P to V and theta. Through the Jacobian and the power flow equations. So, this is where the power flow equations impact the distribution of voltages. What is important is you can show that if you look at the graphical model or the conditional dependence or the inverse correlation of nodal complex voltages for a particular power grid, and let's say if the conditional correlation is non zero, I draw a line between the voltages at two nodes to design the graphical model. I would get a very messy looking graphical model, which is like that. But in reality, to make it more visually appealing, what you can do is you can club the voltage magnitude and phase at each node. And then you have a graphical model, which kind of represents a power grid, but seems to have more edges. So what you actually end up proving is, if you look at the distribution of nodal voltages in a power grid, the graphical model will include the topology edges, so which means the true edges, for example, I and K is also an edge between in the graphical model, but also two hop neighbors, by which I mean two nodes, which are two hops away, so they are not really neighbors in the power grid, are also neighbors in the graphical model. So it is a more richer or more, it's less sparse than the true power grid. Okay. And how do you estimate this uh, graphical model? As I mentioned, you can look at the inverse covariance and for a lot of Gaussian or sub-Gaussian variables, what you can do is you can estimate this covariance using known uh, algorithms which are there in the machine learning community. So for example, one way is known as the graphical lasso, which is the maximum likelihood operator. You can compute, solve this problem and find out S. The optimal S would be the sigma inverse. You can also use what is known as a neighborhood lasso. So what it does is, is basically is a regression problem with some uh, regularizers. So you look at the time series of voltages, one, one particular node, and then sort of uh, project it on every other time series available uh, in your system. Okay? So you can use that to compute what the inverse covariance of the voltages is and get the graphical model. But we are, what we are really interested in is topology estimation and possibly change in topology after. So what mean, which means is if you could estimate this graphical model or this hybrid graph, which includes both two edges and two hop neighbors, you have to identify which are the true edges and which are the spurious edges. And for that, we have two different schemes. So one is what we are calling as neighborhood counting. So this is a very topology or separation based rule and the other is thresholding. And this is a very algebraic rule of estimating the true structure. And then on a the theoretical side, we show that this, uh, both these schemes are actually exact for radial networks, which means if you have infinite amount of data, it will give you a true topology. But there are, it operates under very realistic restrictions for loopy or mass grids. Now to briefly say what a topological neighborhood counting based topology estimation problem is, let's say this was a true radial distribution grid. And this is the ensuing graphical model where you have edges between two neighbors and two hop neighbors. So what topology neighborhood counting mechanism would normally do is we would take a particular edge, we'll remove it from the graphical model and see how the rest of the connections in the system are affected. And what we actually showed as part of our algorithm development is, 
if you remove an edge and you find other nodes which are now disconnected, then that edge is actually a true edge between two internal nodes in the system. For example, if you look at the edge J between I and J, note that any path between node L and node K includes both nodes I and J, or at least one of them. So for example, one path between L and K is L to I to K. Similarly, another path is L to J and J to K. So if you remove both node J and I from the system, then L and K gets disconnected. Now this does not hold true for a different edge such as between J and K. So such a separation based rule, or you count the number of neighbors in the system, which leads you to identify what are the true edges between internal nodes in the system. So we first of all identify what are internal nodes. Here it is between LJ and GI. We remove the spurious nodes, edges connecting them. And at the next step, what we do is identify the edges to the leaf nodes. So this is another rule which says that in this kind of a tree-like topology, every neighbor of a leaf node should also be a neighbor of its true parent. So you can use that to identify what a true parent is. And since now you have learned edges between internal and the edges between leaf and their parent, you have more or less established conditions under which you can estimate the true quality. Okay. And what I showed was for uh, radial grids. We actually showed this also operates for loopy grids, where these mesh grids where there can be cycles. As long as the cycle length is greater than six, which means the minimum size of a cycle should have at least uh, seven nodes. And this is again a theoretical result, which shows where you can do loop me grid reconstruction. On the other hand, we also came up with a thresholding policy, which actually builds up on some prior work for DC power flow based learning done by Saveria Bolognani. But he showed that under this uh, linearized AC power flow model, where you have nodal complex voltages. You can look at the quantities in the inverse covariance matrix of voltages. So this has both theta and V. And you look at the entries of it and you show that this entries, the sum of the entries corresponding to voltage phase angle and voltage magnitude, the sum of these inverse entries for two nodes I and J is strictly negative. So it is below some quantity tau 2, which depends on the parameters of the system, only if it is a true edge. So you can have a threshold based check and then determine if the entry ij, non-zero, but negative, corresponds to a true edge, or is it a spurious edge, in which case it's going to be positive. And this is a more, it is a better algorithm in the sense it has less restrictions. We actually show that this algorithm is able to recover the true topology, even if the system is loopy, but instead of the maximum cycle length being six in the previous case, we have a maximum cycle length of three, which basically means as long as the system does not have triangles, which are almost never there, at least in none of the test cases which I looked, you would have an accurate algorithm by which you can recover the topology. All right, and this is one particular aspect of uh, a simulation result on how the performance looks. And you can see uh, for, for the algorithm two, which is with the thresholding based operations with close to 400 samples, you have, you have your, your, your error rates have almost gone down to zero. The other advantage of this algorithm, again, as I mentioned in the simulation results is we do not assume any underlying knowledge of what edges are permissible and not. If you have such kind of additional information, you can reduce the search space even more and lead to better results. Uh, there is some simulation results here we show if the noise increases, it goes up. In the paper, we also have some theoretical results on the estimation of this uh, matrices in the presence of noise and then giving guarantees on how much noise uh, is permissible in the presence of which this algorithm's correctness is still consistent. Okay. And similar to the concentration results I showed in the first part, you can also look at estimations of uh, uh, the inverse covariance of voltages with finite number of samples. And these are already known results in estimations of such inverses that you can give, you can say how many measurements you require for uh, correctly recovering the reports. And this was all for balanced power systems, by the way, whatever I talked about. So this means you have voltages at each node, which is just one complex quantity with voltage magnitude and phase. The graphical model based schemes also extend very naturally to three phase unbalanced systems. Okay. And if you look at three phase unbalanced systems, just like initially you had a single phase based power flow equations between active and reactive injection under node and the voltages at neighboring nodes. Here, it will be slightly more complicated. You would get the, the injection matrix P is going to have three quantities. It is going to be a vector. 
and this powerful relations is going to be a matrix operation. So for example, instead of node A and B, you now have alpha, beta, gamma, which are three phases at node A. You can also have a subset of phases and you have these complex relationships. And then you can then look at the distribution of voltages in this complex quantity. It looks way messier because now things are way bigger and it, there's a lot more expressions there. But what I would like to uh, have as a takeaway from this slide is that you still have this kind of a one hop and two hop edges in the inverse covariance structure and the graph A model. So at least the topological separation based rule, since it only depends on removing edges and putting them back on, would work correctly in doing this topology estimation. But from a theoretical perspective, we again want to know when do things break down? And I said that even though in distribution regions, hardly ever likely that you will find a triangle. You can see there are some test cases like the IEEE 14 bus test system. And these are again, not true systems. They've been reduced so that you get this kind of compact structure. You may have triangles between uh, nodes. And just using even DC power flow, when this linear is power flow operator, if you look at this inverse correlation space uh, based estimation, you can see when triangles are present, this algorithm actually doesn't work because you see that it decays to a non zero value. So there are still errors even if you have a lot more samples. So, how do you do with general grids when you have triangles in the system? Secondly, I was only talking about static samples when you have independent samples of voltages coming from independent samples of injections. What if this samples of voltages and injections are correlated in time? And this makes sense more from PMU based learning schemes where uh, because the sampling time is so less, this in, the samples are not independent, but they seem to have correlations across time. So how do you take care of both of them? Well, that brings to the final part, which is I'll talk about how do you use some of this graphical model-based architecture to learn even when there are dynamics in the system. Now, heading back all the way to the beginning of the talk where I talked about uh, the kind of models that you have, so one kind of model for looking at dynamics is this, when you have fluctuations due to ambient noise and injections, and this is the swing equation based model. Right? So the right hand side is a net power imbalance. This in static power flow is going to be zero. And on the left hand side, because of this imbalance, there's going to be dynamics of phase angles, such as of phase and frequency. And M and D are basically uh, this uh, constants associated with these dynamics. Okay, there's a moment of inertia and uh, damping. And one of them may or may not be present depending on if there's a synchronous generator there. The noise, which is basically the uncertainty in nodal fluctuations, might be terminal noise or otherwise, is stochastic. And there are models of stochasticity that you can use. You can assume that this noise is short correlated, that is they're independent across time, but there's still correlations in voltage because of the dynamics. Or you can also have dynamics in the noise itself. So there can be stationarity or white stationarity or colored noise where they're temporarily correlated. Now, when I look at graphical model, just to relate it to how the graphical model looks like in the static case, which is the power flow with the dynamic case, these are the two equations. As I mentioned, in the static case, the inverse correlation matrix, so this is a correlation matrix and it just inverted, gives you a graphical model. In a dynamic case, the graphical model or its conditional independent structure is given by the inverse power spectral density matrix. So what is power spectral density? Note that these are temporarily correlated singles, signals. So not only can you compute the nodal correlation of phase angles, uh, at the same time, but you can also look at delayed correlation. So you can look at theta t and look at its correlations minus r, where i can be negative or positive. So you look at correlations at previous time instances or correlations in, in the time series ahead in time. So once you compute this correlation matrix, which is parameterized by the value of delay, you can then look at a Fourier transform of this delayed correlations, which is known as the power spectral density. And then you can invert it to get the inverse power spectral density. And the zero and non-zero values in this inverse power spectral density would represent what is direct dependence or indirect dependence or independence between conditional independence between the different nodal time series in the data. So this is a very simple one slide explanation of how a graphical model would look like in a dynamical context. What turns out, the, even the way in which you estimate the power spectral density matrices is fairly related. So for example, I talked about this neighborhood lasso based approach where you look at the steady state samples at each time instant and sort of project it in across other time instances and this beta entries would correspond to the entries in the inverse correlation matrix for a static case. 
in a dynamic case, you have what is known as a Wiener filter. And this is a very old way of uh, looking at filtering. This actually predates Kalman filtering. And the reason was it is not used a lot in real control. It is non-causal. So what you do is instead of doing, as I was just doing a regression here, I will do a non-causal regression. So I will not just project this phase angle theta time series on the phase angle at other nodes at the same instant, but I will also project them also in the past and the future. So R can be positive or negative. So I'll project it at the same time instant, also behind in time and across in time. And once I solve this regression problem, this is some regularizers used for consistency again, you can show that these beta entries will correspond to the entries in the inverse power spectral density matrix corresponding to the, the, to the time series of different phase angles. So there is a very clear cut way of looking at not just the inverse power spectral density algebraically, but there is also clean ways in which you can estimate it. What is more important is if you look at the graphical model of voltages in this dynamical regime, that is when you look at inverse power spectral density, the structure is still the same. So that is, you'll still get, as in the static case, you'll get topology edges. So the same edges come here. It also additionally get two hop neighbors. So for example, node L and I, which are two hops away, will be neighbors even in this uh, dynamical graphical model. Which means one thing is clear, since the first algorithm, which is based on neighborhood counting, which is removing edges, looking at connections elsewhere, worked on just the structure of the graphical model, the same algorithm, which operates for cycle and getter and six, operates in a dynamical regime as well. So you can use that algorithm for uh, learning a topology from the graphical model of Nodal's, nodal phase angle time series using swing equations. What is more important though is, if you look at the algebraic properties of this inverse power spectral density, note that this is a function of frequency. Again, because it was not computed based on one delay, you looked at multiple delays in time of the phase angles. So it, you'll get a frequency based characterization. So it is not just a static matrix, which means you can find this inverse power spectral density at different frequencies and also look at the phase of this matrix because it's a complex quantity. And here is one nice discovery we made, what is that we saw that if you look at the phase of this inverse power spectral density matrix entries, this phase is constant, that is the ratio of the real and imaginary term is constant at different frequencies, only if the entry corresponds to an edge which belongs to two nodes which are two hops away. So for example, here, if you look at it, the phase, and this is some errors because of sampling, between i and l, which are two hops away, is close to pi and is almost constant, whereas the ones between i and j and i and l, now i and j and i and k, which is direct neighbors, sort of changes more. So what you can do now is, since I know that the phase more or less stays constant around pi for nodes which are two hops away, I can just look at the phase, and identify which are the spurious edges. So all I can do now is I construct this graphical model. I look at the phase of uh, the entries corresponding to two nodes. And if the phase is more or less constant on pi, I call that this is a spurious edge and remove it. Now, theoretically, what we actually showed is this, which is nice is this works not just when the input, that is the disturbances, uh, IID or short correlated, but it also works when the disturbance is white station or cycle station. So that can be long-term temporal correlations in the data and this algorithm is still able to recover uh, the correct topology of the power grid. More importantly, the entire framework requires nothing to do with the power grid other than the fact that it is a linear dynamical system, which means it works for other linear dynamical systems as well, including one which I'll talk about. So for example, in power grids, uh, the simulation results are not that great because, uh, first of all, the algorithm has not been optimized for performance. It is just a consistency result that we have at this point. So, but we check that in high asymptotic limits, it will converge to close to zero. It doesn't decay to a non-zero value. It works for all graphs, more importantly. So it doesn't really require any triangle-based relations that we had in the static case, which means it can have very strong, small cycles and will still be able to operate the true topology. And as I mentioned, it works for any linear dynamical system, not necessarily just power grids. So including the fact we can show that it works for thermodynamical systems. So this was an energy plus simulation that um, one of the students at Minnesota did, where we looked at uh, this energy plus simulation of a uh, building with five different uh, zones. 
which can be represented as a RC network. And you can see that if the information or the, uh, the if you look at the temporal, evol temporal evolution of temperature in this building, which can be correlated in time because of correlated inputs, our algorithms, at least in the asymptotic limit, both with or without regulation, so these two curves are ours, they go down to zero. So it is a consistent learning algorithm, whereas other neural algorithms like graph lasso, which I talked about a static case and all that, even the asymptotic limit will give you errors, primarily because these algorithms were not designed for uh, systems which are driven by temporally correlated or color inputs. Okay. So this was not dynamic evolution. Finally, and this is more as a last uh, algorithm development I've talked about, we also looked at learning in underexcited grids. And this actually came out from a discussion with uh, Zell Yusman, who is a professor in Columbia. So you know that when I talked about these graphical models of voltages, this is both in the static regime or dynamic regime, that is when I looked at inverse voltage covariance or inverse power spectral density, I need to define an inverse, which means the correlation matrix of nodal voltages should be invertible. And just using the powerful relations, you can see that such inversion is only allowed when the nodal injection correlation, so not the voltage correlation, but the injection correlation is also invertible, which, which actually implies that there should be fluctuations everywhere. In a dynamic context, this is equivalent to saying the system is, has a disturbance everywhere or it is persistently exciting and all that. Now, such thing might not really happen. Right. So, and this is known, for example, in transmission grids, because you have zero injection buses. You have certain buses in the system which are not really consuming or producing any power. It is just used for directing power along edges connected to it. So, what happens when zero injection buses are present? Where clearly you cannot find the inverse covariance of voltages or the inverse power spectral density. So, the graphical model directly doesn't imply. So, what we actually showed in some recent work is that if such kind of zero injection buses are not adjacent. So for example, here, the, the squares are the zero injection buses. You can have a three-step learning algorithm to do the polygy recovery, despite the presence of zero injection buses. Where in the first step, what we do is we use some local regression-based test, again, based on powerful equations, to show that you can identify the zero injection buses. And after identifying, you can actually estimate what the two neighbors are. Okay? And, uh, you can identify the zero injection buses in the two neighbors. And then in the next step, what you do is you remove these nodes. You remove the zero injection buses. Now, once you remove the zero injection buses, the remaining nodes have non-zero injections. So the inverse covariance of both injections and voltages are uh, full rank. So the inverse is possible. So we, we learned the remaining part of the network in a cron reduced graph where the zero injection buses have been removed. And this three-step process by learning first the zero injection buses, then the neighbors, and then the edges between the other nodes in the system, you can guarantee uh, correct topology recovery, even in loopy systems when there are zero injection buses. And uh, I, did, I will not go into details in this paper, but we did have some uh, nice theoretical results on how much amount of noise uh, such a system can include, including both for how noise affects this regression based test as well as the noise affects the learning of neighbors in this uh, uh, in the cron reduced graph, which is there in this uh, paper, which is there on our graph. And this is a, a simulation result on 33 bus test system where you had multiple zero injection buses. And you can see in the absence of noise, they really actually go down to zero pretty quickly. The recovery is almost exact and then under noise with one percent you would still get uh, close to less than five percent error when you have thousand samples again this is without prior information on what are the potential edges that you can have so if you have that information you can do much better now talking of practical applications and what i talked uh, as part of this talk was primarily about theoretical algorithm development and giving guarantees you can use such kind of practical provable algorithm as a starting point to get an initial guess. And then you can use that as an initial guess as a starting point to do one start any kind of machine learning algorithm to find the optimal solution. Additionally, which is very useful or important in real world deployment is, you should use additional constraints from real data. For example, as I mentioned, if you had some information about a structure, if you had some information about the kind of impedance values that you have, you can do a Bayesian-based learning algorithm framework where you use the prior information properly and try to find solutions which are near about to the, to, to the prior information that you have. So this is implying that you assume that your system is more or less close to what you already thought it was. So you're just monitoring for small changes and not 
uh, starting your learning algorithm or a search for a true solution from scratch. Similarly, what a lot of people have done and what can be done properly is you can use historical data and prior information to learn or estimate the amount of noise levels that you have in the data. And that can then infer the selection of thresholds. So a lot of these learning algorithms would in, employ thresholds to identify when an edge exists, when it doesn't exist, when, when someone is a parent, when someone is a child. You can use this kind of threshold selections because in reality, those constraints will not be satisfied exactly. You can base it on historical data as well. And just to preface, a lot of work actually has already been done in this kind of data-driven guided algorithms guided by real data, by which I do not mean this is black box learning algorithm. These are learning algorithms where some of the constraints that I mentioned, the data such that cycle has to be of size three or more and all that are not necessary because in real data, you can see that even without uh, those constraints, you can, you can sort of threshold the data properly and then learn a lot of uh, structure and impedances exactly. Okay? And this is work by Matrina Yang, who's here, and uh, Reza and Ram and Shasha. Then there is work by Vijay Aryan doing uh, Clustering based phase identification, again, based on some uh, realistic intuitions and looking at real data from real uh, distribution data operators. What I did not talk about in this talk was also direct samples. So, majority or actually all the work that I talked about was using injection statistics, right? So, or voltage statistics. So, I look at second order characteristics. And this is, there's an there's a, there's a, there's a assumption why I use it because I assume that. Uh, Things can be independent even if there are if the samples are dependent on each other. The statistics can be independent. On the other hand, you can also look at this kind of learning algorithms, and there's a lot of work, including done by Stephen Lowe and Vesalis and Tito, on doing learning based on direct samples. So you have direct samples of voltages or injections, and you look at relations between them instead of the relations in their second order behavior. Also, the talk I gave about use passive data. So I have data collected from a system, and I use that to do some inference. Vales, Vesel is in the last few years have been doing a lot of interesting work on active probing. So where instead of just doing data collection, you go and insert some nodal injections or voltages or a few nodes, small enough so that it doesn't really affect your control signaling in the system, but large enough that you can recover the feedback of the system based on such probing. And then you can do a lot of interesting analysis and understanding of parameters based on it. Similarly, instead of doing just learning, you can also do statistical change detection. So you can not just look at the graphical model, but you can look at changes in the graphical model itself. And uh, there's been done work done by Alejandro and Anwada and all that, where you can look at such change detection and answer questions that if there's a line fault, how long should I wait before deciding that the data is uh, abnormal enough that I should uh, uh, inform the system operator that a line might have gone off and where that line could have been. Okay. Now, just as a Further caveat, when do such methods not work well? Now, majority of the prior work, including the ones in the previous slide, they would use uh, things where uh, linear approximations of the nonlinear power flow equations hold true or are close enough so that you can give some realistic theoretical guarantees. Now, if the nonlinearity is very large, where the linear approximations are inadequate, that should have been one word, then uh, such methods would not work, but there are extensions where you can sort of include some of the insights from it. So for example, you can sort of looking at linear relationship, you can look at kernel based methods. So uh, Professor Ginakis has a lot of work in estimation using such kernel based methods. The such kernel based methods are also linked to coupon operators, which are again, pretty hot in the applied math community in doing, uh, including work with Nathan Kutz and all in learning uh, equations or laws which relate to dynamics of certain systems. Now note that these methods can also be used for designing nonlinear control, and there is work, including given as part of the seminar series, but I'm talking specifically of just estimation problems using nonlinear methods. And finally, you can obviously use neural networks, and now neural networks does not have to be black box. You can do physics from neural networks as well, where you impose a lot of the constraints or domain expertise that you already have in restricting or putting addition regularizers or identifying how you do transfer learning in such kind of neural network based architectures. And uh, Yu Zhao at Sony Book has done some interesting work in that as well. Finally, uh, where uh, one particular use case versus neural networks work well, and this is some work that I've already done, is in fault detection and localization. So fault detection, again, because if the fault is large enough, the kind of changes that you'll see in the system is highly nonlinear. Uh, you can see that uh, this physics informed neural networks 
where you do, let's say, convolutional neural networks or otherwise, but you use some information that you already know that system physics to impose constraints would lead to uh, better results than, let's say, traditional methods such as support vector machines and so forth. So, in the words of Dr. Strangelove, which is one of my favorite movies, uh, uh, what I have done is I've started, I've learned to stop worrying about and uh, loving the neural networks, but with some caution. Okay? So, you have some physics informed constraints and all that that you put in, and then things seem to work. Uh, this is sort of like a fan site. These are the collaborators with whom most of this work was done. Misha Cherkov, who's now at the University of Arizona, and Scott Beckhouse at NIST, who were primarily at Los, before at Los Alamos. There's Murti Salagap at uh, Minnesota. There's Dan Mishra at Los Alamos. And uh, Seyun, Saurav, and Harish were summer students here where some of this work was done jointly with them. And Wen Lee was a summer student here who did some of this neural network based work and is now a postdoc at Los Alamos. Finally, as I mentioned, I'm a part of NC, and uh, this is our website link, and this is my email. So if you have questions regarding some of the projects or follow up regarding the talk or about positions that you have, uh, feel free to send me an email. And that's it. Thank you. And uh, questions.